Welcome again. Um, I will not introduce Brian this time because he was, uh, you all know him, so actually without any further ado, I think we should uh, ask you to, to uh, start. Go ahead. <laughs> <All right. laughs> Thank you. Well, uh, today I want to talk about complexity, uh, how I got into that and uh, how Santa Fe Institute started up. Not quite the same thing, but a lot of overlap. I want to start here arbitrarily in 1965. Uh, I was still a teenager then, and I was third year in university uh, in Belfast, and I went to the World's Fair in New York. I was working in Canada um, in an aero uh, in the Havilland Aircraft Company in Toronto. And on the way back, I stopped in New York at the World's Fair. And it was a truly amazing exhibit. What struck me more than anything afterwards and then was the degree to which American imagination had been captured by science. You know, if you went back 50 years before that, which I don't go back to, science was something done by rather nerdy people in labs and in universities. Uh, the population understood not very much about it. Chemists were king. Uh, after that, physicists took over. Mathematicians re really didn't get much of a look in. But... Um, with the coming of the atomic bomb, for better or worse, suddenly science got an awful lot of respect. By about 1965, which was before America put a man on the moon, the whole place was drunk on the idea of science. And the, the 1965 World's Fair, I have very vivid memories of it, was completely and utterly dedicated to what science was going to do for humanity. It wasn't just America. You went to the French exhibit or the UK exhibit or the Dutch exhibit, <laughs> maybe the Singaporean exhibit. But it was all the same thing, how wonderful science was and what it was going to do for humanity. Uh, incredible. And I participated in this uh, view. In fact, I'd made a pilgrimage on the way in Boston. I went to see MIT. Uh, the only thing I can remember is that they had enor one enormously long corridor from the front door to the back, and that in the lifts you could press a button, but the button, you weren't pressing anything, you were just touching a panel, and that panel had some sort of capacitor in it that triggered the the lift uh, to go to any floor. Uh, this sort of thing was marvelous. And I thought, oh my God, you know, science is going to save us. And sure enough, uh, about four years later, I was in Germany at the time. I sat up at two in the morning watching uh, the first moon landing. All of this in 1965 was before the Vietnam War. The Vietnam War, I think, wiped out an awful lot in America, including a lot of confidence. And somehow science fell into disrepute, not because of Vietnam, but gradually people realized it was all right, uh, but it wasn't going to deliver everything we wanted. Um, <clears throat> a lot of what I said yesterday, what I see happening in all the sciences is change from a sort of mechanistic view of life to a more organic view, an unfolding view of life. And that's what I want to talk about this morning. Going back deep into the past, there was a view that systems, we now call them systems, that uh, organizations in the world, uh, maybe the oceans, uh, maybe what we now call ecosystems, were interconnected. A lot of science had been, in fact, just about all of science was devoted to looking at things uh, in the whole and then more and more and more detail, as if you had a microscope that factors of 10 
you could look into something in more detail. So we were looking at maybe uh, what we now call ecosystems of animals in Africa. Uh, people like Cuvier and others started to look at individual animals, started to look at skeletons, started to look at bones, from bones uh, to organs, uh, to cells, and then finally by the 1950s and 60s to uh, the nucleus and to DNA. So more and more and more detail. And we had 350 years of that from, uh, certainly from uh, Descartes and uh, Galileo on, looking in more and more detail with the invention of the microscope in particular, uh, but other things that came along, um, uh, spectroscopy and uh, ways of looking in more and more detail and the mathematics that went with it. At any rate, uh, things really didn't start to go in the other direction until about the 1960s. People like Norbert Wiener came along. I should correct myself, there aren't too many people like Norbert Wiener. Wiener came along and uh, in, uh, I th if I've got it right, I think he was at MIT. Uh, mathematician and he point, he started uh, a movement that he called uh, cybernetics. In due course that became modern systems analysis and systems analysis was devoted to looking at everything as interconnected and in particular at economies and as I say ecologies as interconnected organisms and in due course, they started to write down equations for the interconnectedness and how these things would unfold. And there was a very heavy belief in the 60s and 70s and on through that if we looked at systems as interconnected objects, we could get somewhere. In fact, with all the known linearities built in, it might be the case you make some small accidental change here and that tips you into a new regime. Those thoughts didn't come out of complexity, they came out of systems analysis and nonlinear equations. There were a couple of people around 1970 who got the idea that there should be a, an international institute for systems analysis. One was Howard Rafa and a counterpart of his in the Soviet Union, uh, German Gvishiani, who happened to be Kosygin's son-in-law. So the two of them, and I'm condensing a huge amount of uh, interpersonal relations and cutting out loads of people, the two of them got together and with their colleagues and companions decided there should be an international East-West Institute. Where to put it, Vienna was a good place. So it was decided they'd have a systems analysis institute that would bring Russians or Soviets and the, and the surrounding countries of the Soviet Union, like Poland, Hungary, East Germany, Bulgaria, together with Western countries. And scientists could talk to each other. And if you were a Westerner, you could meet your Soviet counterpart if you were from one of the Eastern countries you could meet your Western counterpart. It was all very idealistic. So they set this thing up in the early 70s in a little town called Laxenburg, uh, a bit south of Vienna. I was sent over th there to look at this in 1975, 76, by the Rockefeller Brothers Fund in New York. They'd had a request uh, for funding for this new institute. Um, I was working for one of the Rockefeller offshoots, the Population Council in Park Avenue in New York. I was supposed to know about systems analysis. I was very young indeed. They sent me over to Luxembourg, to Austria, to take a look at the place. Should we fund this? Uh, I showed up. Uh, it was indeed gorgeous. It was in the Habsburg Palace. Uh, the whole place was magnificent. But along the walls were these pictures, you know, big posters, save the whales, save the giraffes. What about the oceans, uh, ecological, this, that, and the other. Uh, 
And I found I was very deeply put off. Uh, I didn't announce that I was there <laughs> with a blank check. <laughs> I, so, but as I was there, I was offered two different jobs, uh, one in the population department and the other in the mathematical group. And uh, I went back to New York, wrote a one-page memo to the Rockefeller Brothers Fund, and I said, look, it's beautiful, it's idealistic, it's not serious, forget it. So they didn't fund YASA. Um, I went back to, my wife asked me then, she said, uh, what about that place in Vienna? She said, uh, I said, they offered me a job. She says, oh. And she spoke German. They offered me a job, and I said, well, but it wasn't serious. She said, well, um, is the teaching load very heavy? I said, there's no students. She said, well, uh, is it some small little downtown place in Vienna? You know, rather tiny and dirty. And I said, no, it's a Habsburg palace. She said, well, what about the salary? I said, it's US level and it's tax free. She said, well, uh, what about the setting? Is this palace, you know, kind of in the middle of a lot of stuff? No, I said, it's in a gorgeous park uh, where you can walk every day. So she just looked me in the eye. She says, what do you mean it's not serious? <laughs> so I showed up there and uh, <laughs> the, uh, I took the job uh, and totally ironic, I turned them down for funding. I never mentioned that until about 10 years later, I was talking to one of the directors. I said, by the way, <laughs> um, but I did show up there and I worked for their mathematical people for quite a long time. Um, I'm saying all this because systems analysis was a serious business. Uh, as I showed up, I was supposed to meet my Soviet counterpart. That did come in the form of uh, Yuri Ermolyev, which De who Stefan knows, and, and Yevgeny Nurminsky. These were mathematicians or probability theorists. Really, really top people. I kept getting sent to Moscow and Ukraine and Vrayan. Uh, would you come to our institute? In fact, Ermolyev and I used to sit, and the Soviets, is this being recorded? The Soviets used to send us, we would ask for top scientists from the Soviet Union, and the top scientists would be approved and ready to come. Then you'd get a tele, telegram, no emails then. You'd get a telegram two days before. We are sorry, academician, whoever, has broken leg, cannot come. So, uh, and then they would send a stooge, a stooge of somebody, you know, like a party member would show up. At any rate, uh, in their place. So one day, and we were always amused, or annoyed by this, but amused by this. One day who should show up but uh, quite a good looking man, maybe 60-ish, and, but he didn't look as if he w was top of anything. And, uh, you know, uh, with a row of steel teeth. So like out of a James Bond movie, all the way from Moscow or wherever. And I said to her, Molyev, Yuri, I said, who's the stooge? And uh, Ermolyev says, Brian. This man, no stooge. I said, well, he looks like one. No, no, he says, this man, the great Gulushkov. Gulushkov solved Hilbert's fifth problem, or, or whatever, I may have the number wrong. One of the great problems in mathematics had been solved by the stooge with the steel teeth. So <laughs> still fast forwarding, maybe five years later, Gulushkov has died. I go to the Ukraine, I'm brought into this cybernetics institute in Kiev, which is now the Glushkov Institute. Uh, by way of indoctrination, I'm brought to the Glushkov Museum, and the good lady showing me around the museum says, of course, you're from the West, uh, 
you never heard of great Glushkov? And I said, not only have I heard of the great Glushkov, I have actually met him. <laughs> so she said, this is not possible. <laughs> I said, yes, I, I knew the great Glushkov. <laughs> At any rate, this was the atmosphere of systems analysis in the 1970s, 1980s. That, in a way, got superseded, and the subtleties of this I'm not quite sure of, but complexity, you can think of that as being another form of systems analysis that layers itself, itself on top of the old equation-based systems analysis. I was working in Yasa still in about 1980. I had glimmerings of what came to be called complexity, and it was being done by a, um, it was being done by a group uh, in Brussels uh, under uh, a theoretical chemist called Ilya Prigozhin, and I got on a plane in January 1980 to see Ilya Prigozhin. I was not known, I was very young. Prigozhin nevertheless met me, took me to lunch at the Royal Academy, and treated me like a VIP. Uh, I don't know why, I suspect this was standard uh, for maybe any visitor, very charming. And Prigogine, you know, uh, uh, Dr. Arthur, he says, I just want you to know about a particular point I'm making. As I was saying to the Pope on Thursday, you know, later on I was at a function in the Royal Palace, Brian, I would like you to meet the king of Belgium. <laughs> this is Prigogine, fantastic uh, person, impresario of science, but uh, very intelligent in his own right and controversial, as they say. Uh, had a Nobel in, in chemistry, which apparently annoyed him. He wanted one in physics. What the Brussels group were looking at was what we would now call self-organization. Very much at systems where the individual elements might self organize. I do remember looking at an experiment they had where they had two bowls of watery sugar and they had started with an ant's nest, and one of the bowls was much bigger than the other, but depending on where the initial ants laid pheromone trails, this is work by De Neuber. Uh, then all the ants might go to the inferior bowl of sugar rather than the superior one, and you could reproduce that experiment again and again and collect statistics. So this is my first glimmer. I brought Prigogine back to Yasa. I had him uh, present a talk, and um, nobody there... Well, I, that's. N let's just say that I think that the full import of what was coming, elements self-organizing into patterns uh, wasn't quite seen at YASA because we were very, very much involved in nonlinear equations and probabilistic versions of nonlinear equations. Meanwhile, in Los Alamos, uh, New Mexico, in the US, there was a group of people uh, senior fellows at Los Alamos. It included George Cowan, who was about in his 70s by then. Um, other people, um, including um, Pete Carruthers, uh, Nick Metropolis, uh, quite a few others. Let me get the names here. Uh, David Pines, uh, Murray Galman, Phil Anderson and others, mostly physicists. And they began to discover that what they were interested in, what they were talking about a great deal, were systems of elements. It might be cars and traffic. They might be uh, agents in the economy or whatever, getting together and somehow creating patterns that would self-organize out of their behavior. But with tiny changes, different patterns might organize. One example that interested me at the time, I wasn't with this group, but I remember thinking if you had a bowl uh, or a big flat tray and you filled it with water, 
the water would reach an equilibrium level. From what I was saying yesterday, though, if you polish the tray, but a very thin film evenly of water, there would be positive feedbacks, not just negative feedbacks. Negative feedbacks is if there's too much water in the tray, gravity will pull that down until everything's equal. If you have just a thin film of water, it will form into beads, uh, maybe some quite large, maybe some smaller, no doubt. Uh, Stefan distributed as a power law, I'm sure. Uh, but um, if you repeated the experiment, the beads of water might uh, coalesce in a different way. And they were looking at this sort of phenomenon. They were talking about nucleation phenomena. They were talking about other things. Uh, but they noticed that they were talking about similar problems. And they decided that they would set up as some sort of research institute that would deal with this. And they, they decided that should be not in Los Alamos. There was too much heavy baggage in Los Alamos with the um, atomic bomb project. Still a bad memory for many people, including some of the people who worked on that. Um, but they decided instead they were going to set up in Santa Fe. They got the name the Rio Grande Institute. Later they purchased the name from a, a therapy company, uh, Santa Fe Institute, and they thought that was more appropriate. So they started off roughly in 1983, zero, 1984, a small conference that Mark Feldman was at and a few others. I was still in Stanford at the time. Mark came back from this conference and told me all about this amazing place uh, that had started. My particular involvement was uh, that Kenneth Arrow, who was the uh, smartest economist we had at Stanford, uh, and many people would say in the world, Ken Arrow had a bicycle helmet, a bicycle, uh, and he stops in front of me uh, one day in April 1987, and he says, you know, we want to hold a conference in a small research uh, organization. It's just getting started. It's in the Rockies in uh, Santa Fe. It's going to be in September. Would you come? I had no understanding of this, but I'd heard about the place from Feldman. So I said, sure, Ken. I had no idea. Ken, uh, Ken said, we're going to look at mode locking and things that I'd never heard of. And I said, sure, I'll be there. It turned out that uh, when I showed up, uh, I, sh I was invited to come there early, a couple of months' uh, stay, with one other person. And I asked what the rules were for visitors, and a very small number of people at the Institute then, about 12, including the entire staff. Ginger Richardson, who's running the, the project, she just stared at me. She said, well, you're the first visitors, you and John Holland. I shared a house with John Holland. And uh, for me, this was maybe the biggest, well, I should just say, the biggest eye-opener in my career. I started to talk to John Holland. So this is September 87. We, Arrow and David Pines and Phil Anderson, Anderson and Arrow are Nobel Prize winners. David Pines is a very distinguished physicist. And they organized this meeting of about 10 theoretical economists and 10 scientists, it would include on the scientific side, David Ruel, a mathematician, Phil himself, Richard Palmer, another physicist, uh, and um, on the economic side was, if I recall right, was Tom Sargent, who later won a Nobel Prize, Larry Summers, who uh, went on to become Secretary of the Treasury in the U.S., and was Ken's nephew, and Paul Samuelson's nephew as well. Um, uh, the, and uh, uh, Tim Keogh, uh, Buzz Brock, and, um, and myself. And about, so we had about 10 people on each side. I should add on the scientific side, Stu Kaufman, 
Kaufman uh, was a theoretical biologist and quite an amazing character in every sense of the word. He was a doctor as well as everything else. I once asked Stu, have you ever delivered a baby? Stuart says, hmm, 64 <laughs> was his count of babies delivered. It's not a very well-known fact about Stuart. Um, back to John Holland, we were sharing a house and I would meet, well, meet, we'd, it wasn't really a meeting, we'd get together every night and drink beer in the kitchen, the two of us, and it became clear John was interested in behavior, he was interested in systems, above all, he was interested in games. And I remember him asking me, uh, what do you think is the most important problem in economics, says John. Now, John's about five foot four, He's not an imposing figure. It took me a while to realize I was dealing with one of the truly, truly smart people I'd ever met. And uh, so John says to me, what do you think is the most important problem in economics? And I don't know what inspired me. I just said chess. Why chess? I said, well, it hasn't been solved. It's might possibly have been solved now. I think Checkers has. But I said it's a strategic game. You don't know what you're... You don't, it's not well defined how your opponent's going to play against you. So everybody's exploring and they're looking at what they might do. And the game unfolds and strategy unfolds and you're learning along the way and you're learning uh, how your um, opponent thinks and so on. John took all this in. This was what John had been thinking about his entire life. John thought his entire life, inspired by Checkers, uh, by Art Burks, who was his mentor, who had worked with Johnny von Neumann and had edited and uh, finished writing the von Neumann papers after von Neumann died around 1956. Um, so Holland had been thinking about how do you get computers to play checkers? How do you get them to play chess or any game? And how do you get them not just to play mechanically, but learn to play, to get smart? Now, all of you know that within the last year or so, we've had AlphaGo, we have had algorithms that learn to play against similar algorithms, and they bootstrap up to getting extraordinarily smart, as you know where they can beat the top people in the world at Go. But this is the 1950s, John Holland's at MIT, apparently got the first um, PhD in computer science in America, possibly anywhere. But John's whole fascination all his life was, how do you get computers to bootstrap their way up to get smart? And I was fascinated because I thought if you could crack that problem, maybe we could do something in economics with that. So this big conference between scientists and economists took place on Canyon Road in Santa Fe in the premises of the Santa Fe Institute, which was an old convent rented from nuns for $3,000 per month, and uh, we occupied the chapel, which had been um, suitably deconsecrated. What is it? De de thank you, deconsecrated. <laughs> thank you, the Catholics, <laughs> in advance. <laughs> and ought to have been uh, given what we were trying to do. Anyway, we all met, and I gave the first talk there, largely on increasing returns and poly or earnest games, things like that. The physicists got their hopes up. They said, oh, we have somebody who speaks our language. Uh, but the second talk was in the afternoon, just after lunch, and this was John Holland. And John started to pour out all his ideas about how you make computers smarter. How do you make computer programs smart? How could you change the lines in their code so they got smart? And I sat there and my jaw was sort of hitting the floor. I said, uh, 
I, I couldn't believe what I was hearing. And I looked around some of the other economists and Ken Arrow was paying a lot of attention, but he always did. And some other people were paying a lot of attention. One of the economists, I think from the University of Chicago, uh, had fallen asleep. <laughs> But I was just sitting there, I was enthralled and enraptured and this thought came to me as John was describing these programs getting smarter automatically. It wasn't that you were making them smarter. They weren't updating any parameter to get smarter. They were exploring and getting smarter. And I'm just sitting there thinking, uh, it's like the story I told you about my PhD dissertation yesterday, you know, where the answer came before the question. I'm sitting there saying, if John Holland is the answer, what is the question? <laughs> and I thought the question is all of economics. And this little man who had a perpetual smile and whose IQ was somehow off the charts, had the answer. I was thinking yesterday, what was it? What was his answer? Because as all of you know, or many of you know, John invented the genetic algorithm. He had an approach to what we now call artificial intelligence that was not in line with most approaches. He was not a connectionist or a neural network sort of person. John thought in terms of individual strategies, again, think playing chess, and making those individual strategies smarter, or even getting lines of code to change, or computer programs to change. What John did and described, which caught my eye, was that he had sets of rules. Now, you could think, I'm going to make these rules smarter. You could test them out in some simulation on your computer. You might have 20 rules, and if three of them put putatively worked and the rest didn't, you could throw out the others and bring in the new rules. It wasn't that simple. John had something that I thought was truly ingenious. John was working with if-then rules. The if part said, if this condition, if that condition, if some other condition, and not this condition, and also not that condition, or this other condition. So he could have an infinite amount of logic in the if clause, then execute this, or maybe that, or maybe that. And by doing that and repeating that, he could gather data on what worked. Notice that the if thing, and it took me a while to figure this out. I thought, oh, he's just doing logic. It wasn't. The if thing is recognizing. So if I recognize I'm the rule, I recognize I'm in this situation, I learn to do the following. If I recognize I'm in some other situation, I learn that uh, a slightly different behavior or a very different behavior is appropriate. John had made into computing what I would call associative learning. I, if I see this situation, I associate this behavior. So I'm thinking, I show up in Japan to do some deal. Uh, I don't know. I'm not sure I should bow. I'm not sure how low I should bow. I'm not sure I, it's safe to take a drink before we have all, for other people. But nevertheless, I'm learning in this situation, do this, and that situation, do something else. This was very much the essence of John's thinking. And I'm sitting there not quite recognizing what John's doing, I just took it all in and I thought, oh my God, uh, this is the answer to economics. We had learning situations in economics. There were big, quite sizable mathematical models consisting of equations. The equations would have parameters, might be the exponent of something. And depending on how something worked out, you could tweak, uh, the computer would tweak the component, uh, the the parameter to change, and that was called learning. Here John was describing something that I thought was much closer to reality. In this situation, learn to do that. In that situation, learn to do this. And the situation could include your opponent, and it could include the history of what you've learned. Uh, and over time, these things could get 
I wouldn't say infinitely smart, but very smart indeed. And a lot of this turned out to be applied later in Wall Street. Uh, quants. In fact, about that time, 1991, I was offered <laughs> two or three jobs on Wall Street to do this sort of thing. Instead, I went to Citibank. I was Citibank professor by then at the Santa Fe Institute. And I went to Citibank at, and uh, worked in their analytical group in Hong Kong. And I figured I didn't have enough data. We were working on foreign exchange. We called it investing, but it was basically recognize the market and learn which rules would apply. So I was applying John's ideas. And I thought, I have some data that turned out to be invaluable. It was 10 digits. And I used this again and again. The 10 digits were John Holland's home phone number. And I was, uh, said, John, it's Brian. It's 3 in the morning here in Hong Kong. Do you have a bit of time? And then uh, I'd talk to John. He'd tell me all the inside tricks of setting these things up. So. This, for me, or for anybody who attended that, including Arrow and Summers and uh, Bruel and others, this meeting of scientists and economists was pivotal. And the Institute decided, Santa Fe Institute decided, that they would run uh, their first research program on the economy as an evolving complex system. They invited John Holland to direct this uh, on the scientific side and me on the economic side. John couldn't come. This was 1987. He couldn't get away from Michigan. But I had a sabbatical coming up. And so I said, for sure, I would go. And that was how th uh, the first research got started in Santa Fe. I started to gather people. I had specific people in mind. Arrow was very good. This, by now, this was August 1988. Ken Arrow was wonderful about supplying top economists. Uh, and Arrow himself came for a while, along with his uh, friend, Frank Hahn, who was, I think, from Cambridge. Uh, these were older and the old guard, but incredibly sharp people. Phil Anderson sent us some people. And if I couldn't get people, uh, I would call Arrow or Anderson. I want the following person. Arrow would call the following person, and that person could easily say no to me, but couldn't easily say no to Ken Arrow. So that's how I populated this thing. In the end, I had about 30 people uh, for the first year, of whom I'd say half a dozen did path-breaking work, and that's pretty good. Um, track record. I remember Phil Anderson towards the following summer calls me and he says, uh, there's a guy I like, he says, he mightn't be an economist. Uh, uh, Phil was a little bit cagey about it. His name is Per Bach. He's been working on uh, something he's calling self-organized criticality. Um, would you like to hire him in the economics program at Santa Fe? I said, well, can you tell me what self-organized criticality is? It's, you might know it better as sand pile models. It seems that several of you are nodding your heads. But it was breakthrough complexity science. Beautiful stuff. So Phil, just, I said, tell me what he's doing. So Phil described the whole thing. I immediately thought, this is going to be really important. Uh, so Phil says, what do you think? I know he's not an economist. I said. Sounds like an economist to me. So Per Back was brought into our program. At any rate, these were very early days. The whole style of the Santa Fe Institute was set by that program, not just that program naturally, and not so much by me, but by Stu Kaufman and David Lane. You'd get, we were still in the old convent, you'd get a knock on your door maybe at 11 a.m., somebody would say, we want to get together in the kitchen. It was the only place to sit and talk about um, non-equilibrium or talk about inductive reasoning or something. So we'd troop off there and maybe four or five of us and talk about that. I do remember uh, more than once, 9 a.m., 
On a Friday, maybe I'd get a knock from Stuart. This was during the winter. Brian, do you feel like working today? And I'd say, oh, I don't know. What if we put our skis in the car and went up and spent the day skiing? Sounds good, Stuart. Sounds very scientific. Yes, let's do that. We'd come back then at 3 p.m. and do a day's work after that. I want to um, very quickly talk about a couple of things. Um, one is that the, how agent-based modeling got started. I wouldn't say it started totally from the Santa Fe Institute. There had been plenty of people looking at elements and programming each element as its own separate thing with rules on a computer. A cellular automata worked that way, and certainly Conway's Game of Life worked that way. Some very early experiments were done in Santa Fe, and some very early uh, work was done elsewhere as well. Uh, the earliest work I know, uh, people were talking about automata, and they were programming certain types of automata um, maybe for a dissertation or for individual work. Santa Fe stepped in, like many things Santa Fe did, it didn't completely originate a particular thought. Networks is a good example. Increasing returns is another example. Uh, but Santa Fe recognized these as really good avenues and then built teams around them. <clears throat> and that's the way S Santa Fe progressed. By about 1990, I remember going to DARPA in Washington, Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, showed up there, and in, by around 1990, um, it was Murray Gell-Mann, myself, John Holland, and um, Stu Kaufman. And the four of us showed up. We were calling agent-based modeling. It didn't have a name then. We called it element-based modeling. And I do remember two, three-star generals and really smart people from the Marines sitting down and just grilling us. What are you doing at Santa Fe? What's the difference between doing something in equations and doing it as individual elements that are programmed to interact with each other and maybe even get smarter. The thing that John Holland had excited me so much about was that if we started to do economics this way and had individual agents, we didn't know how to program them to get smarter. That was the piece. We give them a bunch of if-then rules. They can recognize the situation they're in and do something appropriate. They could differ one to the other. So we described all this to DARPA, and we got a grant from DARPA, I think of about $8 million, to follow all of this up. There's one, um, there's one project that came out of this uh, that I was heavily involved in, or at least it was my project, and it came to be called the L for All problem. And I'll mention that uh, this is just the whole atmosphere of how the Santa Fe Institute grew. And it, think of it as being incredibly interactive, people talking to each other, people teasing each other, ribbing each other. I remember Stuart put up a perfectly good nameplate on his door. Murray Gell-Mann had his name on the door, Gell-Mann. So the week later uh, appears this Stuart Kauf-Mann. <laughs> and uh, I'll tell you, there was a little bit of tension between uh, Stuart and Murray. Stuart explained, I said to Stuart one day, Stuart, why does Murray get along well with me, but not so well with you? And Stuart gave me this very good explanation. He says, well, he says, Murray isn't very happy about people who he thinks are his intellectual equal. So <laughs> <laughs> I rest the case. <laughs> One day, Murray is staggering into the Santa Fe Institute with heavy boxes of books from his car. We were a lot younger, Stuart and I were on our way out for lunch. We say, okay, um, Murray's gone in and naturally we helped Murray out and took all the boxes in. 
put him on his desk and so on. At the end of it all, Murray says, thanks, guys. And Stuart says, oh, Murray, uh, any time. He says, for someone like you, any time. And Murray pretends to look very puzzled. But there is no, no one like me. <laughs> so, anyway, L for all problem. There's a bar in Santa Fe uh, called L for all, the, the light or the lighthouse, the El for all. Um, I'm looking at my Spanish expert here. And uh, there's a bar in Santa Fe called L for all. And I thought it, I was looking for what physicists would call a toy problem. Uh, in this agent-based space. And it occurred to me that um, this bar, if it was really crowded, there was Irish music on a Wednesday night. And it occurred to me that if it was really crowded, everybody was a bit miserable. You couldn't hear much, and there was a lot of babble and s smoke and all this. But if it was relatively empty, uh, you could hear a lot, and it was very pleasant. So I imagined a bar at which 100 people might show up on a particular night once a week for music. And if it was too crowded, uh, if they thought it'd be too crowded, they wouldn't come individually. If, they, if individually they thought it was going to be empty, uh, they would show up, or relatively empty. I put a cutoff thing at 60. So if you thought it was going to be more than 60, you just stay home. And everybody was free to make up their own minds in this little problem. I programmed it on the computer. But I want to point out one thing that was to resonate through all of these studies we were doing. And that's that what would have been a mathematical type of solution in standard economics turns out to look much more biological. So let me explain this. If a lot of people think, so this is a problem in expectations, if you like, uh, forecasting. And everybody has their own little forecasting rules or something, or trying to come to some conclusion, should they go to the bar? And maybe somebody says, I'm going to go, and how many people were there the last two weeks? I'll average that. If it was below 60, I'll show up. Now, standard economics would say that everybody is, let's say they're smart, or they learn to be smart some way, and everybody's identical. And if they're identical, then they're going to use the same forecasts. And if they're using the same forecasts, let's say one week everybody says there'll be 23 coming, uh, that they all have the little forecasting machine, that means they all show up and 100 come. And that negates that forecast, it's not much good. Following week, uh, the identical little forecasting machine, everybody says there'd be 82, and then nobody shows up. So what was nice about the self for all problem is that the expectations were self-negating. It was a bit like the liar's paradox, that any expectation that's generally shared will be falsified, because it will give you behavior uh, counter to that expectation. And so there isn't a rational expectations answer, at least in that narrow sense. What was the answer? I programmed this thing and what I discovered, and I allowed all the little agents in this problem to have separate ideas, separate forecasting devices. And if some forecasting method they were using I threw in a bunch of ad hoc types of things and ladled them out like an alphabet soup, different, half a dozen different forecasting methods to each of the hundred people at randomly. Um, I discovered that, uh, and they were going to go on what was most accurate for that situation, the most accurate forecasting rule of the ones they had. What I discovered was there was a lot of noise at the beginning, but it settled down to an equilibrium around about the comfort level, sometimes above it, sometimes below it. But, and this is the punchline for me, there was no, never any answer 
that was true ad infinitum. There wasn't a limiting case. It turned out that each of the agent's forecasts would be valid or not depending on the ecology that was formed by other agents' forecasts. Other agents' forecasts depended who would show up, determined who would show up. So I might be doing pretty well with my forecasts, but then other forecasts might change. That would change the situation. I would have to compete in an altered ecology. And it turned out, and I tracked this, that the agent forecasts themselves kept changing. The 60 on average showing up was maintained. So this was a bit like a forest where the shape of the forest remains the same, maybe over centuries, and the individual trees keep changing. And so I want to stop here on complexity and say that what I was finding and what other people were finding in Santa Fe, and not everybody was in Santa Fe, what we were all finding was that what appeared to be a rational solution, when you broke it out and you imagined that individual agents had, didn't know that rational solution, or as an L for all, a standard solution would, would negate itself, if you had situations like that, people would explore. But they'd explore using strategies or forecasts that were operating in a situation or an ecology caused by other people's strategies and forecasts. Now, coming from Silicon Valley, this was clear, you know, I'm going to launch a little tech company. It's going to launch into an ecology of other tech companies that may support me or may be rivals, etc. So what we were seeing again and again and again in complexity was that the outcome was very biological. And uh, I remember one particular study by Christian Lindgren that I keep citing and referring to. It's a classic, 1991. I won't tell you what the problem was, but the outcome looked to me paleontological. Many possible strategies. One strategy would dominate for eons in his work, and then somehow someone would find a little agent and his computer would find a way to exploit that strategy, and then there'd be a completely new ecology. That strategy would take off, gather adherence, and there'd be a huge amount of chaos for a while. Then one of the new strategies would take over and be quiescent again. So it's like the age of the dinosaurs, the age of the mammals, age of something else. The image I want to leave you with here is that Santa Fe Institute was a startup. Nobody knew if it would work. Uh, we didn't think early on in terms of complexity, but what struck us was that we could start to look at problems and relax the assumptions. Not all the agents in our models needed to be the same, and agents could learn. And in that learning or exploring, they found themselves always in an ecology of other agents. And that ecology was something they could adapt to, but in their very adaptation, the ecology would change. And so this was a new world we were all looking at. There were two other... Uh, complexity classics, among other things, and one was done by Steve Lansing, uh, your work on Bali, I mean, um, amid, amid many other things, and Stefan, who has done some beautiful work, but one uh, study of his that caught my eye was done on uh, banking and systemic risk. So what I'd like to do for the rest of this se session bear with me is to bring them up as, and create a little panel and uh, want to ask, would you come up and just pull over a chair? And we'll ask, we'll ask them about com complexity and what their idea, rather than me just say where I think it's going. Do you want to be over here, uh, Steve? Sure. Um, as most of you know here, practically everyone knows, knows uh, 
Steve has his own distinguished career as an anthropologist. Now, now I'm introducing you. <laughs> you wouldn't believe how smart this guy is. <laughs> anyway, Steve, and Steve runs the Complexity Institute at NTU. He's got a very distinguished career. Stefan has a distinguished career, trained both, if I recall, as a physicist and a, an economist, particularly in finance. I believe two doctoral degrees. He has opened and is running the complexity hub in Vienna. So you have represent, and I think we're all external professors at Santa Fe Institute, so we have some sort of Santa Fe uh, pedigree among us. Um, what I would like to do, kicking this off, is to ask, just uh, open by asking Steve if he wants to add any comments to what I've said about the history of complexity and the history of the Santa Fe Institute or complexity in general. And then I want to interrogate Steve and then open it to uh, three of us talking together about complexity and to the floor. Thank, thanks, Brian. Is, is this uh, working? OK. Uh, Compl it's yeah. a tough act to follow. <laughs> I can give you a very simple perspective that I bring to this, which is um, coming as an anthropologist and social scientist, if you ask me what complexity is about, I was trained in the social sciences. I actually went, did graduate work in economics and got put off, actually, by equilibrium economics. So it's a very, uh, to, to me, what's happened is complexity asked the question, how do you understand systems that are not at equilibrium? We didn't used to do that. Uh, it's still not the usual practice in the social sciences. That assumes, so that assumes that things are at equilibrium, meaning that they are stable, they're unchanging, and you vary parameters and you look for solutions. The more we explore the living world, the more we look, explore economies and environments and social systems, we have to realize that there are usually lots of attractors, that that's an unrealistic assumption about how the world is. Therefore, we need tools to enable us to, to detect uh, nonlinear economics, uh, nonlinear patterns, and to understand them, to look at patterns of change from one equilibrium solution to the next. Um, so that's true for ecology. I, that's an area in which also I've taught ecology. It's true for the social sciences. And it's especially importantly true, I think, for the coupled interactions of humans with environments, where it's a slightly more complicated problem. What happens if we have coupled systems in which humans interact with the environment and the environment responds to the humans. That to me is the challenge of our age. It's the challenge that has come upon us suddenly. In my lifetime, the world's population has tripled. Tripled. It will not be able to do that again. UN predictions now are that uh, within a few decades, 90% of the human population will live in cities. The question is, is that possible given it means an enormous continuing rapid, enormous expansion of consumer society. Not sustainable, obviously not sustainable. That's why I say this connection between humans and the natural world is the challenge of our age, like it or not, it's the challenge of our age. And I think complexity is the only area in which people are really seriously looking for solutions to that question. So that's why I think it's important. Uh, so let me now pass the baton to Stefan. Yeah, in particular, Stefan, you've just opened in the last couple of years a new institute dedicated to complexity, at least it's the complexity hub in Vienna. What are your ideas about complexity and what led you to invest in this idea? So what led me to this idea um, goes back 20 years when I first visited the Santa Fe Institute as a physicist, a very narrow-minded phys particle physicist. Um, and what I did not know what complexity was back then, but I've, I've seen maybe 10 extremely intelligent people all working on subjects they picked and subjects they were interested, and um, they did not work. Uh, I didn't know that such a thing exists. Um, from the place that I came from, um, that you don't have to work on problems that other people give you, but that you can um, can be interested in solving your own problems 
that you that you invent and create. Um, and I've I've um, met my all-time hero there, Murray Gelman, mm. who was working on not particle physics, but on how languages spread through the Americas. And he was just doing this in a very intelligent way. And other people were doing things which were everything but mainstream. None of this was mainstream. Trying to solve problems in a setup that was just intelligent. Um, <laughs> for example, if you, by looking at non-equilibrium systems that you don't try, as in physics, solve them with equilibrium methods. Hmm. So, um, um, so I was immensely attracted by this clever way of dealing with self-posed problems. And um, I thought that was complexity. <laughs> but so, it, took, it took a while to, to figure out what, what was the common background of all of, all of these people, what they were doing. And I, by now I have my own um, concept of what I think complexity is. I think it's, it overlaps extremely well what, with what Brian has said. Uh, and w with what Steve just mentioned, this non-equilibrium aspects, um, complex systems are always composed of many things, and these many and these components are are connected to each other. Not everyone to everyone, but but through a network. And um, the properties of the elements change as a function of how the things are connected. And that's not yet a complex system. It's a physics kind of system. But if you allow the interactions change as a function of what the objects look like, what the properties of the object are, then you get a complex system. If the states of the elements change as a function of the interactions, and if the interactions change as a function of the states of the components, then you get a complex system. Um, and I think that's exactly what, what Brian said. And, and these systems are what? These are evolutionary, these are open-ended, these are um, uh, non-equilibrium very often. Where's the context of these systems? Very often you say that, that, um, that um, complex systems you cannot take out of, of the context, otherwise you destroy them. The context is that you don't necessarily have one network, but you have a whole array of networks um, which link the same set of elements together. And for one layer, all the other layers are the context. Mm -hmm. So you have a very self-contained, at least um, conceptually, a very self-contained picture. And, um, and the problem is you cannot solve these systems with with an analytic approach. You cannot write down differential equations and then solve those. These co-evolving uh, multi-layer networks. Um, and coming back to Brian's talk at the, at the winter school that just finished, um, you can solve these, these problems by seeing them as automata, as, as machines, as, as algorithms. And, um, and um, what I think is, is fantastic in our time is that it's not just a blah blah concept like I'm now saying, or now mentioning, you can link this with data. You can, you can, you can make an, a, a physical or an empirical science out of it because with, with new data sets you can, at every point in time, for many systems by now, um, see how these elements look like and how they are connected and how these things change over time. Great. Um, what I'd like to do, and Jan I'm sure is keeping an eye on the time, but what I'd like to do is ask one more question of each and then throw it open to the floor and you, you can query any one of us or, or disagree or whatever you want to do. I have a question for, a, a second question for you. Where do you see the, the, this topic, this subject going? 
And uh, feel free, free to be critical. You could say, well, oh, it's a bit of a fad. It's not really going anywhere. I don't want to tell you what to say, but what do you think, uh, where is it heading? Or if you don't like that question, where's your own uh, interest heading in this area? You know, I, actually, I like the question, and I have an answer. Having been listening to, what, to the story you've been telling us, Brian, you, you pause and contemplate what we've just learned. John Holland comes up with the idea of a genetic algorithm, an evolutionary approach, basically instantiating, not mimicking evolution, but yeah. creating evolution in computers. And he writes a wonderful book on adaptation in natural and artificial systems, showing how that works. Mm -hmm. Then he went on to look at classifier systems. It's all completely abstract. At the same time, uh, this Stu Kaufman, the other kind of major figure at the beginning, okay, who was a medical doctor who was just interested in the question of what happens, how does systems self-organize? How can that how can that work? So those are two very abstract concepts that got stirred around in that nunnery in uh, in kind of <laughs> then enter Brian. Within a couple of years, what he's done is taken those ideas and expanded upon them, worked on the L for old problem, and shown that the whole domain of economics actually could be reformulated in this way, an alternative to, to the last 200 years of, of, of uh, economic theory. You can use this to rethink the question of how economics works, because it, you know, it it occurs as a result of human interactions, and there are emergent properties. So bringing those two groups together within almost immediately, right, well, within a couple of years, you had a whole new program. And that became the model for other empirical programs at the Santa Fe Institute. It's sort of why it worked. That, but, but the, uh, maybe the most interesting, you, if you think back, okay, and suppose we roll the tape back to that time and say, what other domain would have been particularly suitable for trying to bring these concepts together with some empirical questions. I, I think economics was really the best mm -hmm. choice. Economics is already mathematized. It had all the domain, it had all the elements, right? We have emergent properties latent waiting to be found. We have a lot of data, or we have, you know, a lot of data existed, and it worked. By golly, it worked. I mean, this, that led very quickly to all kinds of insights into economics. It's a new field now complexity economics. But that also, I think, set the, set the direction for the Santa Fe Institute as people have been exploring other ways, other connections. So for example, we were talking in the taxi coming over here about networks. Networks are all over the place now. I think Stefan said we, he guesses maybe at 10,000 um, dissertations about networks recently. Oh, we have no idea. I have no idea whether that's true or not. But certainly, they're very much uh, in, in vogue. Not all of that work happened at Santa Fe, a whole lot of it did. And the point is here we have the application of some fundamental ideas in the formation of patterns on linear systems, linear and nonlinear systems actually, that then can be applied to many empirical domains and new, new um, discoveries follow. So you are actually getting the history of a whole new way of thinking about the world in these lectures, I think. That's what I, I want to keep trying to embarrass Brian, but I think what he did really You're was fundamental. You're succeeding. Okay. All right, take it, Stefan. <laughs> yeah. So what's, what's maybe, or what, what I think is, hmm. yeah, what are future directions? There's two possibilities. Either a system dies out, which is maybe what we see with systems analysis, and, and so it gets very... People get older, they're less innovative, not many young people joining. That's one direction. The other one is that the field grows. And um, I think that's what we're experiencing very much in, in complexity science. Brian was talking about a conference that was more or less 20 people. Hmm. Beginning of the 2000s or 2005, there started the, this, this conference on complex and complex systems, which started with about 100 people. It's now about 1,000 people. Um, so the community is growing. Um, um, if the output is growing per nose, I don't know. Um, and it's, um, um, 
maybe we're running. I, I don't know. Please say uh, what, what you truly think. <laughs> um, maybe we are running the risk that we are becoming so big that it's possible to create a mainstream, that the next generation is just mm. copying what, what, what the, the, the generation before did, and that the, the must for science to be original and to be not mainstream is getting lost a little bit. And um, I sometimes see a little bit of this. Mm -hmm. I, I would like to see complexity science as, as a science that always um, tries to solve actual problems with, with the methods um, that you need for solving it and not by things that you have learned, like network science, that you apply something onto some thing where you shouldn't apply things to. Um, and you should always do it in a the, in the maximum intelligent and practical way. So sometimes I have the feeling that we're not doing that all the time. There is a, <clears throat> a town in Texas called Austin, Texas. And it, it's always kind of on the forefront of whatever, hippie dome or something. But they have a t-shirt that says, keep Austin weird. And that's what, I, <laughs> that's what I'm getting from what Stefan says. What I'd like to do, Jan, if the timing is OK, is throw the whole thing open to the floor. Uh, if you're directing a question, kindly say who it's to. But there's three of us here, and we have maybe some similar ideas. Yeah, I'll, I can hand the mic across. Uh, but direct your question to one person in particular, if you want. Uh, my name is Incheng. Uh, I'm a HR and OD professional. I uh, have been interested about complexity science and how it's being applied to organization for quite some time. Um, would be would love to hear your views on where do you think the state of applying complexity science is when it comes to looking at organization structure, adapting to the fast change at the organization level. And second part is, where do you, how do you think complexity science can also guide individuals to deal with the unfolding reality, unfolding changes every day? Because right now, from a HR angle, we are seeing lots of stress, uh, lots of anxiety you know, within people at the workplace and, and so on. Stefan. Mm. To the first part of your question, I think complexity science can be immediately, uh, complexity science in combination with da available data can be immediately of practical use for planning, for optimizing, for visualizing um, systems of, of public interest, and be it I don't know, in the area of cities or, or, or production or opinion formation or um, economy, financial systems. So I think that's, that's one of the beautiful things that it immediately, without intermediary, a science becomes, a science is practical. The one thing I'd add, I think you directed the question to me. It gave me a moment to think. But I, I think that uh, complexity isn't so much a set of methods. In a way, it is. But it's also a somewhat different way of looking at the world. And in any organization, it's good to be aware that there are nonlinear effects. And small changes can tilt the whole system one way or another. It's a different way of thinking. And also that maybe small changes, maybe you get some people to do more exploration out there. It's not an, you're not in an equilibrium system. You can, you can say I want some experiments here. If they, if they don't work, that's fine. If they do work, we can replicate that and implement them better. And there's tipping points. So uh, thinking this way gives you a very different way of looking at the world. Uh, no. Uh, okay. Not my area. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> Very good. We'll take the next question then. Uh, 
my question is um, um, related to how teams are organized in each of your settings of your, your centers and Santa Fe and um, the, the research projects as well as the center that we have in Singapore. Um, how, I mean, you have a group of very intelligent people coming together. And my experience with working with intelligent people is that they don't really like to follow instructions, right? <laughs> they like to do their own thing. Um, but what you have here is that um, a group of intelligent people who are motivated coming together working on similar or maybe tangential problems and, and yet seem to be going towards a emergent um, direction uh, together. Um, how, how do we, I mean, how do you, in your experience, organize such teams? Um, and I think the, 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 the verb here I, that I use is really tentative. I'm not sure if the word organize is even the right verb. Uh. And I'd like to hear from you, what are the verbs that you, you think uh. are really useful to think about teams when you put them together? Well, um, I was asked to lunch uh, about two years ago by the people who fund science here. What's it called? The Ministry of yeah, keep going. National Research Foundation. Thanks very much. A small number of them invited me to lunch. Uh, and they, I don't want to say anything negative about them, but <laughs> let's just say these are super intelligent people, civil service, they know what they're doing. I walked into the room, I thought, oh my God, the IQ in here is just staggering. Uh, very, very bright people. and. I was the person they'd invited, about 10 of them, and uh, they said to me, we have a question for you. Uh, how did you organize the research at Santa Fe? You know, you set up the first bunch of people. How did you organize the research? I said, what do you mean organize? So it was essentially your question. Uh, they said, well, how did you pick the projects uh, to be uh, developed at Santa Fe Institute? And I thought for a moment, the question didn't compute for me. So I said, can you repeat your question? Yes. How did you pick the projects to invest in uh, with your group in Santa Fe? And then I said, well, I, I didn't pick any projects. And now it didn't compute for them. They all sat there. And, so, and uh, I hope I'm not saying anything on camera <laughs> going that is offensive. It's just two different ways of looking at it the world. So it didn't compute and I said, what I did was pick the people. In fact, it wasn't just me. It was Arrow and Anderson and David Pines and sending me people like Per Bach. But um, so I thought about this later and my answer to you is if you want to get standard work done, tell standard people what to do. And I don't mean that in a, that sounds terribly high handed and patronizing. But if you want a building built, you get people who know how to handle concrete and cranes <laughs> and pour the concrete. If you want to get extraordinary work done, and this is what we were aiming at in Santa Fe, then you very carefully look for talent. You set up a container where you're saying, here are the rules. You know, we go skiing on a Friday morning or whatever. You know, whatever the rules are, uh, we want you to uh, think of anything. In fact, uh, the very first two weeks when our economics program was set up in Santa Fe, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what was permissible. So I phoned Arrow and Anderson, and they phoned John Reed of Citibank, who was financing the whole thing. And Arrow calls me and says, the word has come back from John Reed, what he wants for his money. I said, what, what does the funder want? He said, the funder wants you to do anything you want, providing it's not conventional. And so I picked, uh, we had people who were interested in doing something not conventional. The moral of this story, just to say very quickly, is for standard projects, bring in people and tell them what to do. But what I would say to the authorities in Singapore is if you want really super work done, just bring in super people. 
you can point them in a direction, they won't always go in that direction. <laughs> but, and you'll have a batting average. Maybe a third of them or, or a quarter of them will do something really significant. That's how Santa Fe got started. And the important thing about Santa Fe was that there wasn't a tradition. You could talk about econo non-equilibrium economics, which I'll talk about next time, but there was nobody there saying you can't do that. Uh, people don't say it at university, but they make it clear that this is not part of the tradition. So we just go to the next question. Well, wait, I do oh, have one comment. oh, very good. Two rules. The first rule, so the first rule is when you show up for the first time, give it a good talk. And the, and the second rule, which was pretty, pretty rigorous, rigorously enforced, was show up for tea. <laughs> the idea is if you're going to sit in a cubicle and only work by yourself, we don't want you. We'd like you to come and talk. So they have, they, they have tea, and tea is pretty good, and you're supposed to show up and talk to people. These are rules we're going to rigorously enforce here in Singapore, right, in our own <laughs> institute. Um. So uh, I was really intrigued by uh, what all of you, um, how all, you, all of you mentioned that it's it's um, it's in the applied, uh, it's in the application of complexity science uh, that you get really interesting work. And uh, to me, one of the really interesting applications is in international development and the improvement of human and social um, or just quality of life, right, for people in in, in countries, especially in developing countries. Uh, which is why I'm working on this problem with my co-founder in this startup that we've created. One of the challenges that we face is in when we work with um, a lot of the different stakeholders, it's difficult to communicate this lens, this, this view of, of complexity, right? Because they're very used to working in linear ways. Mm -hmm. And if you cannot explain that inputs A will definitely lead to outputs B, then, then they find it difficult to put the investment in. Um, so that's just on the stakeholder part, but on the, on the science of it even, um, we find it quite difficult to, to determine at which point do you model until you say, okay, we've modeled enough and now we want to gather empirical data to feed into our systems map for example. And this is, it feels like it's a judgment call, and I'm not sure, because you're kind of uh, young in this space, so we're not sure how to make that kind of judgment. And I'm just wondering what your views are. Stefan. I don't know if, if complexity science is already at the stage um, where where we can offer solutions, especially when, when problems are really, really big as, as the, the field you're working in. Um, since there's the word science with it, science means um, to, or it means to me, that you, you're doing something in a predictive and quantitative way. And how can you prove that you really understand the a system, be it complex or not complex, if you can predict how it's going to um, work out. or You don't have to predict the future, but you, you have to predict the, the properties right, mm. um, and you have to predict um, what the system properties are if you change certain parameters. Um, and the only proof that you get it right is that these predictions work sooner or later. And I don't think we are there yet. Maybe we have solved a little, some parts, some very um, narrow spots, but we cannot go to the drawer and open it and take out something for a complicated problem. Certainly not yet. Hi, my name is Vincent. I work in NTU. Um, what, I actually have a more methodological question. So one of the things I've always been wondering, right, in the study of complexity sciences and uh, the very agent of complexity itself, right, the, the automata, what kind of, um, I mean, how would you study uh, an agent that you do not know about? It can be an organization, maybe not the person, because we know how people think and what motivates them. Maybe we don't. But 
um, when we want to understand maybe from a big data perspective, right? we have a lot of data information of the behaviours, the networks, the connections and all of that. How do we discover what the states, the different states of behaviour in, in the automata are? Right? What, what, what is the basic, how do we conceptualise that? Yeah, thank you. Do you want to say something? Uh, just very quickly, uh, I can tell you this will be the subject of the next talk. <laughs> Good <to Stefan. laughs> and it's a great question. Uh, but uh, modeling and complexity is really all about figuring what possible behaviors could be. And in general, economists at least have decided, traditional economics says everybody has a very well-defined problem. It's not that hard to well-define problems if you assume everybody's the same as everyone else. They're all facing the same problem. Therefore, they all know what the other person should do. And usually, there's a unique thing that's optimal, etc. What if you're not in that situation, which you're not in general? Well, the uh, best you can do is explore. One of the hardest things I had to learn, and I learned this from John Holland, but it's all over the place in economics. Uh, George Shackle and quite obscure economists who are really deep. Uh, the thing I learned was that people can make decisions when the situation's ill-defined. You get lost. How are you going to get home uh, without a GPS? You get lost. The situation isn't well-defined. You don't know where you are. So at least in California, I drive around until I see a sign for a freeway. Oh, 287 or something. I don't know where that goes, but I, have a, I vaguely know when I'm pointing south or something, and that freeway's going the right direction. We do this all the time. So economists think well-defined problems, deductive solutions are the norm, and then occasionally there's ill-defined stuff. But actually, it's the other way around all the time. <laughs> we don't know where we're going, what on earth we're doing, and occasionally problems are quite well defined and you can assume that. But the whole of the next talk. Stefan may have more, more insight than that. Um, I was just going to ask, what is your personal philosophy on taking your theoretical ideas into um, the real world systems and then from there in with policymakers or with banks or with startup founders or whoever has the power to change those systems? Um, and how do you see your ideas come into real world fruition? And what's your philosophy on it? Well, you're the man to ask on that, stuff. <laughs> and um, I think policymakers are, so I don't, I don't know what, what, what you mean by um, personal philosophy. <laughs> <laughs> but um, opinion. <laughs> opinion. Okay. okay. <laughs> um, policymakers are listening more and more. I would say, yeah, and right. um, and um, and also we have to show more and more, and we have more and more data, and and I think. Um, People who have been working or who are working in complexity science are extremely well prepared to make some sense out of this data. Because, as Brian said, um, um, these people are aware of, of the of tipping points, of, of power laws, of, of, of driving of, of systems and, and Etc. Instabilities, resilience, breaking points, etc. Um, Do you want to mention your uh, banking ah. uh, systemic risk very briefly? Yeah, one one example that that generated a little bit of interest, or still generates interest, is that if you know how banks are connected through transactions, through then you can work out quantities of systemic risk, not only for the individual banks. You know, so systemic risk is what is what is the damage that, that happens if one of these agents goes bankrupt. 
you can also compute the systemic risk of every individual transaction. If you know that, you could try to tax systemic risk. So you could put a tax on every transaction and you can show mathematically or with an agent-based model um, that, that by imposing such a tax you can eliminate systemic risk because the network is rearranging in a way um, that contagion doesn't happen anymore. And um, one country has already implemented this to monitor, to monitor the systemic risk at, of every transaction at every day, it's Mexico, and Canada might, might implement it soon. So, and this, this of course, um, yeah, this shows that relevant people are listening to this. By the way, that's classic work, really beautiful stuff. Should we go on to the next? Or on to the next maybe. I'll just quote Richard Feynman that he often said that he just needed to be allowed to have a little doubt. To be just to be able. Feynman, the physicist, often asked, "What's his general theory?" And he said, "I just need to be have the space or to be allowed to have a little doubt." Hi, I, I don't know when, whether I'm banging on the same drum that's been coming up, but uh, I guess you guys have heard about um, the March for Our Lives protests in the US, right? Uh, something very big happening right now. If you had an opportunity to address some of the teenagers, some of the youth involved in that movement, what can they learn from you guys as they try and create their own systems that will change? Is there any advice you might give them? No. <laughs> Actually, uh, uh, just very quickly, I'll say that uh, for I was trained in linear systems and linear algebra and linear programming and all, and it was an eye opener for me a few decades ago that there are nonlinear effects. In particular, I think that the gun, the anti-gun. Uh, forces or the gun control people powered by young people is extraordinary and I can remember I've been long enough in the US to remember when there was a tipping point for tobacco and a tipping point for many other things we haven't reached that yet in evolution more people think that evolution hasn't happened in the US than think that think it has. But gun control is at such a tipping point. The other thing I would add is if, if I, I believe there are two huge problems for humanity that this younger generation will have to cope with. One is climate change and the other is artificial intelligence. And coming up is also gene editing and I think we can do an awful lot uh, to look at, we're already looking a lot at climate change this Steve's uh, Asian School of the Environment, etc., in NTU and other places. Steve and I are going to a conference in a week's time in Sweden on, on things like that. But AI, artificial intelligence, nobody's really talking except a few gurus like Stephen Hawking. And uh, on the CRISPR thing, gene editing, there's been a, a we need people to, we need thoughtful ideas. This not, isn't necessarily the three of us, but it's definitely your generation needs to think about this. But the advice is, there is a tipping point. And if, if um, you keep going in the direction, you will at, at some time hit it. And then, then uh, progress is made. And the world is changed. All right. I think this is a good moment to stop. I think we should thank Brian and the two panelists. Oh, thank you, guys. This time. And I personally think of this session, this is going to be historic. Is this, this session here? This one? This one. Okay. I think this discussion on complexity and where it's going to, between the three of you, well, I thought it was great. You're all in it. <laughs> thank you. So, see you in the door, room next door, but definitely see you on Monday, the 2nd of April. And also thanks to Jan and Karen. Thank you. <laughs>
See you on Monday. Thank you.